Because the gospel question that is set today is so incredibly pertinent to Christianity after religion. One of the things that Diana Butler Bass did, and did very well, was just to remind us how we get this differential between religion and spirituality. So you'll see on this side of the pillar that you can see at the top it says religion, and I couldn't quite get spirituality with making the words so small, but you've got spirituality and religion. It's interesting, on this side, this is a top-down exercise. Look what you have. You have religion, and then what is the most important thing in religion? You've got dogma. Dogma and doctrine. Somebody, somewhere, will tell you what you have to believe. And then from that comes a set of rules. You have to live by the rules of that doctrine and dogma, and then that comes right down to us, the members. But bishops and popes and all the rest of it, they have the power to work out the dogma. They will tell it's either from the scriptures or from the historic formularies of the church or whatever. And that comes down, and we are the members at the bottom. We are given something that is sent down to us. And we know from history that the people who play that game don't always play fair or by the rules set by Jesus Christ. On the other side, we've got something quite, quite different. Under spirituality, this is not a top-down, but this is a bottom-up. So, what have we got? We've got neighbors. Here you are. Anna, very bravely, I did warn her last night, pulled you forward, because most of you sit right at the back. Me and my God syndrome, you know, me in my corner and you in yours. We know where we like to sit. That's fine, okay. But there are times when we need to know that we are neighbors in Christ, that we are here, not with all the answers, but that we are here trying together to make sense of the big question, what must I do to gain eternal life? Not just power now in this system, but life in Christ forever, in a way in which we will be supremely satisfied by that which we find in giving ourself, our life, our thinking, everything to God, which most of us, including moi, don't often manage to do. So here we have to interact with who and what we are as our neighbors. And then we move from being just neighbors, we move to something which we might call practice. How do Christians worship? How do we need to support one another? How do we need to put into action the things that we know are common to us all and that we all need as human beings? And from that practice comes conviction. So it's from the bottom up. Finding ways to be authentic as Christians finding ways to start with that which is most important to every single human being, whether you're a believer or not. The family of man is our starting place. We know that in the Diocese of Albany, we're given the top-down model, and there are certain people within the family of man who shouldn't be in our social group anymore because of their sinful lifestyles, or because they don't believe the fullness of that particular dogma which is given to us by our leaders. The church is in a mess, and we are hemorrhaging members by the year, not just in Europe, which was the heartland of Christianity and Christendom, but here in the good old US of A as well. And if you watch the Pew Report as it comes out, you will see every year a diminishing number of those who will call themselves Christians, and even less so those who will say that they do anything about their religion, because most people are fed up with this kind of model. So it was for me a huge question, because I struggled with this in my ministry, of how to be a good pastoral leader, how to be a good teacher in St. George's, and at the same time live between that model and wanting to foster this model, so that we as a congregation start with who and what we are to find through practice of our worship, our faith, our study and life together, the conviction 
to find what God is really doing in our lives. For me, I guess, the bottom line is, and this is the painful bit, and it might be painful for you too, I was brought up in this system, and for a long time I loved that system because it gave me security, it gave me everything I wanted. And when I was one of those priests who were vehemently against the ordination of women in my black suit, going off to forward in faith events and things like that, I loved that tight system. And then it started to crumble. And I found that when I talked to my neighbors, the women who had clerical collars around their back, they really weren't witches at all, as I've been told in that group. <laughs> they weren't that bad at all. And actually, I found new people I found people I'd written off in that system who actually were good, godly people, but I just never even seen that. I still have to convince Maggie, but that's another story. But I found that there was a way in bringing me to a conviction about God that required something of me just as it required something of the man who came to Jesus. Do you remember in the gospel I've just read to you? It seems like a long time ago because it's a long sermon, I'm sorry. But remember how the Gospel Mark tells us that when Jesus gave that man his answer, what did he do? He went away sorrowful. He went away with a heavy, heavy heart and no doubt a heavy face because Jesus asked him to give up the one thing he found most difficult to give up. And isn't that true for most of us? Giving up the one thing that we like? Oh, come on. We even find this in Lent, don't we? Well, I was going to give up gin and tonics, you know, this Lent, but I tried last Lent, and I mean, I can't live without gin, <laughs> whatever. So I give up candy, okay, well, candy's not that bad. At least after Sunday Mass, I can go home and have my gin, but I don't have to have the candy. But we never want to give up the stuff that really, actually takes us over. And that's where all of us are in the same boat. That's why this morning, I haven't preached six foot above contradiction in the pulpit. I've come down on the same level as you guys because we're all in this together. So what does Jesus say to that rich among man? He says, you've got to give up that which you prize most. You might have kept all the commandments, but I'm asking you, if you really want eternal life, to give up that which you prize the most. And he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. He walked away with a long face and a heavy heart, no doubt cursing under his breath, saying, ah, I tried. Religion sucks, huh? I've looked at many things in my life that I've had to give up, and it's been darn tough. But when I've given them up, that's when through finding who I am in you guys, through better practice, a conviction that I really know I'm on the right track in following Jesus, although I know it's not easy. So we have to say adios to some things, and that's the hard bit for us. And I'm so grateful for Diana Batlebus, Bat Butlebath, who gave us a wonderful poem at the end of her last session, which just hit me like a ton of bricks. The poem is called Adios. And it's written by someone called Naomi Shiab Nye, who is part Mexican and part Palestinian. There's a good mix. Just listen to the words of the poem, Adios, letting go. Adios. It's a good word, rolling off the tongue, no matter what language you were born with. Use it, learn where it begins, the small alphabet of departure. How long it takes to think of it, then say, then be heard. Marry it. More than any golden ring, it shines, it shines. Wear it on every finger till your hands dance, touching everything easily, letting everything easily go. Strap it to your back like wings or a kite tail, the stream of air behind a jet. If you are known for anything, let it be the way that you rise out of sight when your work is finished. Think of things that linger. Think of things that linger. Leaves, cartons, napkins, the smell, the damp smell of mold. But think of things that disappear. Think of what you love best, what brings tears into your eyes. Something that perhaps said adios to you before you even knew what it meant 
or how long it was for. Explain little, the word explains itself. Later, perhaps, lessons following lessons, like silence following sound. What is Jesus asking you to let go today between that and that? I pray you will not leave church today like the man in the story with a long face and a heavy heart.